Most of you know me, and you know I'm a Maritimer, so I have to start with a Maritime expression, but when I've seen so many of old friends and so many people that I've known for such a long time, I said, my God, it's old home week. <laughs> so I'll dispense with all of the formal introductions and know that I'm among friends. I regret that Peter couldn't be here tonight because we could have also had some, or this today, because we could have, uh, would have enjoyed some discussion about some of those old days on old home week. Uh, it's been a long time since I was part of the media, but I do have to tell you that about 10 years after I'd left CBC, Mary and I were at a gathering and we met a couple of what I call blue-haired old ladies. <laughs> and the blue-haired old ladies were always my crowd. <laughs> that was my groupies. And this wonderful, quite pretty blue-haired old lady said, I know you, just a minute. The name will come to me. I know you. And then after about 10 seconds, she said, it's right on the top of my tongue, but didn't you used to be somebody? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing in the media, of course, we're always looking for that fine, wonderful 10-second or 5-second clip or 6-word quote. And I heard one yesterday, and I loved it. There's fight in the old girl yet. <laughs> the husband knows that more than anyone. <laughs> now, your organizers asked me to, and others to pepper this presentation with good stories. The best story is the story that you all accomplished. And that was moving away from a colonial-style government of the 60s and 70s, charting, negotiating, and settling four comprehensive land claims, and redrawing the map of Canada through the creation of Nunavut. As my editors used to say to me a countless times, that's a hell of a story up there, Whit, and I would say it's the best story in Canada. And part of the story was because it was also a story of misdirected government policy and so many government decisions of the 60s and 70s that actually became building blocks for the Inuit of Canada to win the public support that they were going to need in order to achieve their dreams. So I want to highlight four or five of those for you today. I want to start in the 1968, coincidentally a year after I arrived as a fresh reporter in Frobisher Bay. In 1968, the Trudeau government announced its white paper on, the, on Indian affairs. And at that time, they used to use that term, white paper, as a label for a government policy statement. And I, and, uh, and I thought, what an interesting name for a paper that was totally assimilationist as far as Aboriginal people in Canada were. <laughs> and the result, of course, was that there was immediate, forceful, and effective political fallout all across Canada, not only from Aboriginal people, but from by many, many who supported them and also found that their rights were grounded in the legal system. Now, you would think they would have learned from that, but barely a year later in Yellowknife, and almost a year, 42 years to this day, the then fresh-faced Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs, John Kretchen, released the second white paper, also assimilationist in its tone. And that was a northern development, and the quote was clear. It was to tap the vast untapped riches of the north in the benefit, for the benefit of all Canadians, with barely a mention of the northern Aboriginal people who lived there. So just as he'd done earlier, Kretchen wind up sowing seeds of discontent across the north among, among young men and women, and some of them may be sitting beside you today. Young man, there's one of them sitting beside you, in John Amagwalik. They didn't buy in. The federal government didn't get the message immediately, and for the next several years it pushed hard for the development and it financed and backed unprecedented financial commitments. 
hundred million dollars of announcements for highways, incentives for oil and gas exploration in the Mackenzie Delta, the Beaufort Sea, and the high Arctic islands. The whole Arctic was a buzz, and the whole country was tuning into this great northern development paper. The oil companies, taking the government's money on one hand, asked for more on the other, and they said, we can't do all of your development without satellite technology. And so suddenly satellites were going up. But the federal government of the day couldn't really justify that other investment to the oil company, so it was sold to Canada on the basis that it was going to bring radio and telephone to the Eskimos and the Indians of the high Arctic communities. And make no mistake, at that time, there was little or no communications across the north. Yellowknife, Frobisher Bay, a couple of other communities, of course, had radio and, telev and, radio and, and a telephone, but most of the other communities did not. So that's how they sold it. We're going to bring it in the accelerated northern package, communications to the far northern communities. And so the first of the satellites went up, an X satellite. That was, in my mind, the greatest tool that the Inuit had, and they used it. And I'll say this, that in that period of time, it just seems that not much was going right for the federal government's plans. First, this, I'll just, I'll just uh, summarize them. The seeds of the northern and Inuit unrest were certainly planted by the government's own development and assimilation policies. Secondly, I say those seeds were germinated with the political BS that were contained in so many of the government's own statements and actions. And now, suddenly, people were talking to one another on the radio and television, radio and telephone, and more than that, they were demanding to be on our airwaves. So I say that it was this, that satellite communication that really provided the sunshine that made those seeds of unrest blossom. And it was not only what people were, uh, were, were saying that brought about change, it was often what they were hearing. You know, sometimes it takes only a few words uh, to change things, and one of those simple statements came from the then appointed commissioner of the Northwest Territory, Stuart Hodgson, who always took great pride and, and credit of moving the government from government offices in Ottawa to Yellowknife. And in a moment of interview with one of my colleagues at the time, Val Wake, he said proudly, when Val was questioning about the colonial rule of the North, Hodgson said, I am the government. And boy, I tell you, the fat was in the fire. Because across the north, the young leadership said, not for long. <laughs> there are other times when the really big story just walks in the door into a tiny newsroom and sits down and interrupts a young reporter who's there banging out a story with two fingers on an old black typewriter and says, Hi, my name is Tyga Curley and I'm here to organize the Eskimos and we're going to have a land claim settlement. And the hotshot young reporter re responds more or less, well, what the hell is a land claim settlement? <laughs> Thankfully, we all know the answer to that question. We also should know that as Tagak was organizing, so are all of the other Aboriginal organizations across the north. And especially in the Mackenzie Delta, where the Inevaluate had formed COPE, the Committee for Original People's Entitlement. It wasn't a one-way street. Others were organizing, and Yellowknife, a different group, sprung up, concerned that its rights to the wealth of the North were being threatened. And so we had, for a time, white power north of 60. It was a temporary but powerful racial force, and it drew out the racial divide that was never very far underneath the surface in those late 60s and early 70s. Ask me now of a reporter if in those days I ever woke up and wondered what I would, if I'd have trouble filling the newscast that day. It was really all we could do to keep up with a story that was very much on the national agenda and our own national radio news couldn't get enough of it and soon other media couldn't get enough of it either. 
And then consider this, another key point, was Trudeau's turnaround. When the first react mention of land claims came up, the Prime Minister said, there's no such a thing. Nobody has any more rights than any other Canadian. All Canadians are equal, but within a couple of years, he changed his tune. He was not only funding the organization, but he was also being influenced by the growing public support nationally and the reasonable and legal, legal uh, sound arguments that all Aboriginal organizations, and especially the Inuit, were presenting. Really, it, in the South, it became a David and Goliath story, the kind that everybody loves, but in the Northern context, Goliath, he was the big bad guy, and little David, he was winning this one, and he was winning it on every front. And the federal government soon felt boxed in with a tiger by the tail on Aboriginal rights. It needed to reconcile matters, and it went to that old standby Canadian card, the Royal Commission. <laughs> it appointed Mr. Justice Tom Berger to the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline Inquiry. It was an interesting appointment considering the final outcome. Berger's hearings are historic, but they're also key to how the overall Inuit story unfolded. Because the Inuit, the Inuit position was advanced, and I had the privilege of sitting through every single day of his hearings. The Inuit position was advanced mostly through the Inuvaluate, who had legal standing at the inquiry, and in capsule, the Inuit clear, focused, and reasonable position was that no major resource development should happen until the political constitution, social institutions, and instruments were in place, including land claims, to allow people to participate and benefit from those developments. I tell you, in my mind, that the Inuit positions advanced to Berger were the foundation for every positive development that came since, including the constitutional rights, a fully elected NWT Legislative Assembly, the eventual creation of Nunavut, and four comprehensive land claim settlements. And I can still hear and see a very young John A. That's Amagualic for those of you who are missing a few chapters in Canadian history. <laughs> appearing before Mr. Berger at the Government's Conference Centre in Ottawa during his national hearings. And he said, and I didn't have to look it up because I remember it. He said, Mr. Berger, to you and others, it is a northern frontier, but to us it is a northern homeland. Berger's microphone was always open, and by this time I'd learned to listen in my little earpiece for certain sounds, and I could hear, and I can still hear, the scratching of Tom Berger's pen as he copied down that line. And that was the title of his report, Northern Frontier, Northern Homeland. It's my view that Berger's biggest contribution to the North and Canada was not necessarily the recommendation for a 10-year moratorium on development, although that was unprecedented. Rather, I think the, the lasting value is surely the way he conducted the inquiry by taking his time to give everybody from the smallest outpost to the largest community and communities and cities in Canada a chance to speak. Some very strong and bitter things were said by many on both sides of what I call the racial divide, but in the end there was a much greater understanding and tolerance on both sides. Never was that more graphic than in 1982, when a fully elected NWT Legislative Assembly arrived en masse to Ottawa to the First Minister's meeting so they could support the Aboriginal and Inuit demands for constitutional recognition and protection. I knew all of those MPs personally, and I also knew that 10 years earlier, some of them closely identified with the very aspirations of that long forgotten white power group. Now, if I could have one wish, it would be that I could end this presentation right here on this remarkable story of accomplishments that together, I think we've a, a national dream realized. But sadly, I'm unable to because in my head and in my heart, I am still a reporter. Moreover, I recently agreed to assume the chairmanship of the Canadian Children and Youth Foundation, 
and children and youth of the Arctic have the biggest stake in the North's unfolding future. So I say from the heart that I fear quite frankly that the story of the next generation is going to be rapidly in the opposite direction, that it's turning from a story of accomplishment to a story of self-destruction and social disintegration. And I thought about that very carefully before this presentation. I need not recite the social statistics, including those of violent crime and youth suicide. We've heard some expressions of that yesterday by Rosemary and Kathy Tatungi. I also know that reversing social destruction won't be easy, and in fact, I think it may be even more difficult than all of the constitutional and political accomplishments of the past 40 years. But I think the talent is still there, and the will is still there, and the power is still there, and the fight is still there to do it. Because it will take the same kind of collective commitment, dedication, and resolve that was very key to those past victories and accomplishments. I believe that one of the, the key is education, and I know Mary and ITK are on the right path with the education strategy, because it is an ed Inuit education strategy for and by Inuit, and when I speak of any of Mary's initiatives, I always know that I'm about to be accused of bias, but I used to say all the time as a reporter, just because I'm biased doesn't mean I'm wrong. So. <laughs> but as important as the education strategy is, we have to also remember that it's an institution. Education is still an institution, and institutions alone will not rebuild the social fabric of a community. Only the community itself can do that. And I know we all recognize that. I'm not sure what role the media is going to play in the development of the North in the next 30 years. I think the question becomes, is it going to be a story of redemption and renewal and a return to self-preservation or continued social and self-destruction? The complex answers, of course, remain with the communities and their leaders, both young and old. And so I thank you all today for this opportunity.